Since Roe v. Wade legalized abortion here in the United States in 1973, over 62 million lives have been lost to the procedure. On January 21st, the annual March for Life takes place here in Washington along the National Mall. The march is an in-person event this year after going virtual in 2021 due to the pandemic. Over 50,000 people are expected to take part. Joining me now to discuss the pro-life cause and the need for more legislative protections for life is physician and candidate for governor in the state of Minnesota, Dr. Neil Shaw. Dr. Shaw, thanks for being with us. I want to start with this week's March for Life and what it represents to you and the nation. How important is this march, particularly when the issue is before the Supreme Court as we speak? Well, it's incredibly important that our voices be heard, that those who want to defend life, that defend the unborn, uh, are seen in the public eye. <laughs> I've never thought that there, we would get to this point where we would have the Supreme Court uh, ready to undo one of the worst decisions they've ever made. And I think that we have that possibility this spring. So this is a particularly poignant time to have the March for Life in Washington. And I'm hopeful that after that decision, uh, those, uh, uh, the ability to restrict abortion will be uh, delivered back to the states. Well, with this Dobbs decision looming at the Supreme Court, uh, the court's expected to rule at the end of this year's session. Now, President Biden and the House and Senate leadership are committed to enshrining Roe into law, meaning abortions on demand. How important does it become to have pro-life governors leading the states should the court overturn Roe? It becomes extremely important. I believe that there is a chance that when the Supreme Court overturns this, what they will do is return those police powers to the states where they appropriately belong. It will then be incumbent upon each state to ensure that they are defending uh, the unborn based on the laws that they have in their state. And I look forward to being the first governor after Roe versus Wade is overturned to help in the long battle to defend the unborn in the state of Minnesota, which is unfortunately one of the most pro-abortion states in the nation. Yeah, yeah, talk to us for a moment about the um, activities of Planned Parenthood in your state, which are pretty, they're very active there. Well, each year, uh, 10,000 Minnesotans uh, lose their lives before they have a chance to be born. And Planned Parenthood is responsible for about 60% of those and the overwhelming majority of those are taxpayer funded. Um, if you think Roe versus Wade is bad in Minnesota, we have a ruling from 1993 called Doe versus Gomez. And Doe versus Gomez mm -hmm. enshrines the payment for abortion services into law and essentially forces mm -hmm. the state to pay for the killing of unborn Minnesotan. So while we've been able to chip away at the edges with pro-life legislation, such as uh, supporting crisis pregnancy centers and ultrasound bills, still the majority of abortions in the state are going to be funded by taxpayer dollars. And we look forward to starting mm. the process of undoing Doe versus Gomez with the election of successive conservative pro-life governors in this state. Mm. Now, you're a physician, a family man, a son of immigrants. Why have you decided to wade into politics and run for the governorship of uh, Minnesota? Weren't you having a happy life? Why get into I, all I, of this? I love my life. I love my three kids. We have a fourth one on the way. They're all blessings. I love my wife. I have a growing practice. I love my patients. Uh, but for too long, I took for granted freedom and liberty. And 2020 was very traumatic for many of us. Uh, we realized how tenuous freedom and liberty are. We realized that the career political class would sooner keep themselves in power than stand for any set of principles. The people of Minnesota are tired of what the career politicians have done to the state. They're tired of people failing to stand up for the unborn, for failing to defend our God-given rights. And they want someone who mm. comes from the outside who's going to actually have principles that animate them, that inform them, that uh, allow them to govern in a way that is transparent, and that is based on uh, morals and ethics. Uh, for too long, we've let the career political class destroy our state, and it is time to take it back, and I believe that now is that time. Now, you have made uh, the pro-life position a central plank in your campaign. You're running on it. How would you implement pro-life policy? What's the first thing you would do if elected on this front? 
Well, it is a long struggle. And for the warriors who've been fighting for life for decades, they realize how long that struggle is. In Minnesota, because of the Doe versus Gomez decision, it is a series of successive gubernatorial wins that we need by uh, very pro-life governors to appoint enough uh, justices to the Supreme Court to lay the groundwork for a set of laws that would undo what Doe versus Gomez has done. Now, in the, that time, mm -hmm. I would look forward to signing legislation that would challenge that in court. But realistically, we do need the makeup of that Supreme Court, primarily who are appointed by governors, to have a constitutionalist bent. Once we do that, then we can get that legislation through. So as the first person through, uh, I would very much want to champion pro-life views, uh, attempt to win hearts and minds, lay the groundwork to get uh, constitutionalist, originalist judges appointed to the Supreme Court and ensure that there are people who come behind me that can take up that mantle and continue the fight once I've gone back to my practice. Because the last thing I want to mm -hmm. do is end up with a career in politics. I'd like to serve and then get back to running my practice and uh, spending time with my kids. I love that philosophy, which which harkens back to the founders. You know, these guys were lawyers and uh, um, uh, local inventors and publishers, farmers. They went back to their their uh, vocation after public service. It was always intended as a service, not a lifetime career move. Uh, what is your message to viewers this week, doctor, as people all over the country commemorate this grim anniversary of Roe v. Wade? We have the opportunity to take back our states and our countries piece by piece. You, we the people, are responsible for that. We can run for school boards, city councils, mayors, state representatives, state senators. We can turn the tide in Congress. We can become state executives. We the people are in charge of this country, and for far too long, we have allowed the career political class to run America into the ground. I say to you, no longer can we allow that to happen. We must rise up at every level and take our country back, restore constitutional principles, defend life, defend liberty, and make our country into the country we want it to be, the country that brought my parents here 50 years ago and the country that I hope my children will have to grow up in uh, as they age. Dr. Neil Shaw, thank you so much for your time. We will be watching your race. Thank you again. Thank you.